Praise the Lord, everybody. Are you glad to be in the house on this Wednesday night? Yeah. If we can, let's all stand to our feet and just give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Magnify him for a moment in this place tonight. What a great opportunity to be in his presence, amen. Come on, let's magnify the Lord for he is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. If you got any prayer requests tonight, let them be made known by the raising of your hand. Just remember Brother Walter and his family. I know there's many, many other requests. Let's go before the Lord tonight with these needs. Lord Jesus, we magnify you, O oh God, for we're fearfully and wonderfully made in your image, O oh Lord. God, in this my soul knows right well, God. I know, Lord, that you are the mighty God in Christ, that you are able to do all things, Lord. I know we're in your hand and you protect us and keep us, God. You said you know what we have need of even before we ask it, Lord Jesus. I pray, God, that you move upon each and every need in this place tonight. God, every hurt, every sickness, every pain. God, whatever it might be, oh Lord, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstance, God, I pray that your will will be done in this place tonight, God. God, that when they are healed, when they are touched, that they'll remember, oh God, that it's only you and only by your mercy and only by your grace that we are who we are, oh God. We give you praise before it even happens. Because, God, we know you're able to do it, and we give you honor for that. We magnify you for that because you're great and greatly to be praised, Lord. Have your way in this place and bless every heart, every mind, and every spirit in the name that is above every name, in Jesus' name.
Sometimes, Brother Blake, we see those things in faith as they will be, not as they are presently. Amen? So when we begin to look and say, okay, it might be dreary, Brother David. It might be dark. The waves might be washing over the boat. But I know the Lord said we're going to the other side. Amen? We're going to make it to the other side when we got our faith and our trust in Him. Amen? I'm looking for a, a, a home where my builder and maker is not. But the Lord, it's him, amen. It ain't me. It's nothing I can do about it. But it's all him, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and just magnify him in this place tonight because he is worthy of all of our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We was reading, you may be seated for a moment. I was reading in the bread the other day. And uh, in Luke chapter 5 and verse 17, and it said, And it came to pass... On a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by and they were come out of every city and every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present to heal them sister Stephanie when I read that I thought wow the power of the Lord was present to heal them it was there brother Cody to heal them. It was there for them to receive it. It was their choice to receive it. We walk into this place tonight, we come with a choice to show up, but we also come with a choice to receive or not to receive. Amen? Because the Lord is going to do what he wants to do, but we must allow him to do it, Brother David. I want to come into this place, not just sit on a pew and hear the word, but to glean something from the word to take that word that I glean and to give it to somebody else, amen? Because that's what it's supposed to do. That's what it's supposed to happen in our life. When we hear the word, we allow it to work in our life and we turn around and give it to somebody else that they can know that he is alive and well and able to do things. He's still on the throne, amen? Amen. amen. I thank the Lord for what I feel in this place tonight. I thank the Lord for his mercy and grace. And Sister Heidi, if you can, let's give them the ways to give on the board tonight. We have GiveLify and PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. You can send your cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, 1031 Mill Street, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We have the tithing that's closest to the pulpit and the offering that's on the outside of the pulpit. We also have text to give, which is 833-883-9311. Now, if you can, let's say this prayer with me tonight. We're going to say it like we mean it. Amen. All right, upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, and the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, Estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprise, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received, my whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessings. I'm blessed going in and I'm blessed going out and all that I do will prosper in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Come and give with what the Lord has blessed you with.
let's shout to the Lord for a moment in this place. Hallelujah. I magnify you, Lord Jesus. You are worthy, O oh God, of all of our praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. He is alive and well. Amen. I know we had a great Easter crowd. A lot of people's talking about what they felt and how they felt in this place. You may be seated, but God was here. Amen. And the same God that we had Sunday, he's in the place tonight. And he was with me all day long. And he'll be with me tomorrow if he gives me another day. Amen. I'm thankful for his goodness and mercy. If I can get all the Riverbend kids and the Riverbend ignited to come up here, we're going to pray over and get tonight. Ask that God will touch you and protect you and keep you, help you to learn something back there in the class. The word says that thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen. That's the end goal. We can put it in our heart that we won't fail him, but that we can be more like him. Amen. If you can, let's raise our hands to these kids tonight and let's pray over them. Lord Jesus, I magnify you, Lord, and I thank you for each and every one of these young people and each and every one of these kids, God. I pray that you touch and strengthen and encourage and bless them. I pray, God, that you not only move in their lives, but you move in their families, Lord, their moms, their dads, their grandmas, their grandpas, their aunts, and their uncles. God, everybody that they come in contact with, God, their friends at school, whoever they're with, oh, Lord, that somehow, some way. God, what is instilled in them will begin to overflow from them, oh God, and be a blessing to those around them. I pray, God, that you use them, that you strengthen them, and that you encourage and bless them all the days of their life, and that they grow up into the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and be exactly what you've called and created them to be. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen and amen. Take them on back, Red. Amen. As pastor's coming tonight, won't you just turn around and shake somebody's hand and tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord tonight. Last week, the Missouri District had Brother Morrell Cornwell do a, do a uh, home Bible study uh, seminar, how to teach home Bible studies. And uh, he said he'd been waiting for five years. Y'all remember Brother Cornwell? I showed you one of his messages up here about the, the uh, evolution of a soul winner. And uh, he said he'd been waiting for five years for somebody to invite him to Missouri because five years ago the Lord spoke to him and said that Missouri is about to see a revival, an outbreak of revival like it's never seen before and that, that the place it's going to be through is home Bible studies wow. and home Bible studies are when you get a friend and you get a, a acquaintance, a co-worker, anybody that's hungry and you start teaching them the Bible. It's a novel concept. But uh, uh, I, I know we preach Sunday about distractions on the road to destiny, but I felt something clicking in my spirit the last couple of days. And uh, I want you to know you're about to come out. You're about to come out of whatever it is you're going through, but you better be ready to come out. Amen. Y'all, y'all just come for the singing? Huh? Y'all was all hyped and crunk for the singing. And I, I don't want you to be hyped. I don't want you to be hyped. But I don't think you believe me when I said, you're about to come out of this. And I think it's time we start acting like we're coming out of it, like we believe we're coming out of it. Amen. So tonight, uh, basically because 
I feel like the Lord very strongly pulling me in another direction, an essential direction. I, um, um, we're going to try. I know uh, Brother Christian nearby had a heart attack when he saw that big old graph on the back of his handout. Have y'all seen that? Yeah, he about stroked out over there. And, uh, but that's, that's for you. I'm not even, I, I'm kind of going to teach from it, but that's something for you to have because I'm going to give you some mission for the promised land, finally in the promised land, in completion, but I want you to know the work ain't over. The work wasn't over for the children of Israel. Everything they were going to accomplish was not in the wilderness. Now, we do not in any way assume or want you to think that we've covered. The truth is, I could have been, you remember, we, were, we did creation, then we did formation for 12 weeks. I could have probably done 20 more weeks of it. All right? I'm not telling you we got everything covered. But I am telling you, I believe I gave us enough stuff to work on for a long time. And I hope that that's what's happening. Honestly. If you go home and, and put these in your outhouse or in the bottom of your birdcage or something, they're doing you no good. You know you're supposed to be working on you outside of church. I was feeling guilty this week and I, I've got a lot to cover and I'm going to get done, but I was feeling guilty this week about we've got some people, you know, the recovery people and, and working the steps and all that, that are down here almost every night of the week. And I'm like, Lord, what, what's the deal? We're going to burn everybody out. And if when you were in the world, somebody got a party going seven nights a week. My, one of my uncles, one of my daddy's brothers told me he was an iron worker. And he would get off work and go to the bar and didn't leave the bar till time to go to work the next morning. True story. Never even went to sleep. Do it two or three days in a row. He really, oh, Lord. Anybody ever read some C.S. Lewis? Anybody ever read much of C.S. Lewis? Oh, C.S. will hurt your feelings. And I've been asking myself a question. How long has it been since I've done anything for God that cost me something? Brother Shannon and I have talked. I'm just going to talk to you and then I'm going to get in. We've, we've talked about, we'll say, boy, I don't want to go to recovery tonight. But I go on and go to recovery because guess what I'm going to do if I don't go to recovery? Sit at home and do nothing. Before we started recovery, you know what I did on Tuesday and Thursday nights? Not much of nothing. We got an opportunity to work for the Lord. We're laying up treasures in heaven. So Sunday, I, I told the guys, I, I told somebody this. Maybe it was at recovery last night. Maybe it was at Sunday. I don't know when it was. I told somebody. <laughs> it's all running together. Chapter 13, and on being a servant of God. Has anybody read it yet? Yeah, well, I've read the whole book a couple of times, but I'm talking about reading it for this week. Let me give you a little piece of advice. Put it on the back of your commode. I don't act like I've lost my mind. Y'all all do that. And read that chapter every day. Just read it. Don't study. Don't write about it. Don't just read it. I'm going to tell you right now, chapter 13, to me, has the potential to be the best chapter we've had so far because it's talking about ministry and the temptation to quit, which we all face. Okay? So we have not covered everything there is about formation. We have not covered everything that God's going to grow in you. You're going to grow in God. But C.S. Lewis, the aforementioned C.S. Lewis, I'm reading a book that he wrote right now called Mere Christianity. I highly recommend it. Very easy to read, but it'll hurt your feelings. Now, he is British, and I'll tell you right up front, 
He don't think there's nothing wrong with drinking once in a while. All right? So that's going to be in the book. Don't think I've recommended the book so you can go pop a top on one. Because I don't believe that. Okay? But he says, I want you to listen to this, Brother Shannon, Brother Ronnie, brother, even Brother David, what we talked about over there. Listen to what he says. I read it this week. Now, I'm going, this is going to hurt your feelings a little bit. It's going to hurt your feelings, but I want you to hear it because it's the truth. Listen to me. When a man is getting better, do y'all understand what he means by getting better? Growing. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse or not growing, he understands his own badness less and less. A moderately bad man knows he's not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. Is that not what we've been going through? What we've been talking about? Just when you think you got it all figured out, you wake up and get slapped in the face with Y-O-U, and it ain't pretty. There's a blessing in knowing you have things to work on. I said there's a blessing in knowing you have things to work on. To feel or to think that you have arrived is in effect proclaiming your own righteousness. And there is no difference in one who does good and believes that that makes them right or righteous and one who does bad but calls it right and therefore declares themselves righteous. There is no more righteousness in you doing good than somebody doing bad and claiming it's right. Does that make sense? Somebody go, I don't, I think I can do that. I think there, there's a movement in, in, in many cultures in our world right now that, that it's okay for a fella to have a, a couple of girlfriends on the side. How many of you know that that's okay in many cultures? It ain't. Not in the kingdom of God. All right? Matter of fact, if you ain't married, you can't have zero on the side. And if you're married, you can't have zero on the side. Am I not supposed to talk about that? But if you say it's okay for me to do that, you think you're right. Right? You're declaring your actions righteous. I know what the Bible says, but it don't really apply to me, right? That ain't no different than saying, I did this, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, that the Bible says, so I must be righteous. No different. Your actions do not declare your righteousness. His actions declare your righteousness. Oh, we don't like that. We want to check a few boxes. Oh, man. There's none. Matter of fact, Brother David, and this is powerful. When that young rich ruler come running to him and said, good master of the Lord, first thing he said was, what you doing calling me good? He never sinned, but he was in the flesh. And the, the truth of the matter is, I feel the Holy Ghost in here right now. The truth of the matter is, what we preached two weeks ago about being confronted with yourself, it's still happening in us and we don't like it so much. Real quick, Brother Kevin, because I'm on a roll, brother. I, I can't hear you. No, 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 no side pieces. Oh, come on, you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. You can't be busting a move if you ain't married. <laughs> See, that's a perfect example right there. 
Big Kev, he thought he done found a loophole. Come on, man. We in church, brother. Them old Morehouse people, man, you got to watch them. Do y'all understand what I mean? You're wasting your time. We like to declare our righteousness. It doesn't, there's nothing you can do that makes you righteous. Oh, I, I believe it. It's true. I know some of us, we want to be righteous. But that means you got a problem. Look here. We are all corruptible. We are all in need of God's grace and mercy. And we will be until this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality. We got to learn to deal with that. So, advance at your own risk, if you please. And understand that the growth of the wilderness can be best summarized as, I have come to a place where I know that I cannot live one second without God. Where all of my successes combined cannot afford me the opportunity to gloat or glory. Where the greatest of feats is found only in the most humble of service. Where in him and only in him will I be made complete. That's the introduction to completion. Advance at your own risk. Lord's going to lead me to some places. Get ready. Don't be, going, don't be getting to where you got to go to the bathroom right in the middle of conviction. Because the Lord's going to lead us to some places tonight. See the promised land. It was God's idea. Brother David, I don't think there's any record where Abraham went and prayed and said, would you make a land and send me there? God came to him and said, get out of your father's house and go to a place I'm going to give you. This was God's idea. He first told Abraham in Genesis 13, 14 through 18, and you don't have to put all of them up there, but right after Lot chose the best ground, remember that? He told Abraham, he said, I want you to go out there, boy. And he said, I want you to look as far as you can to the north, the south, the east, and west. He said, all of it, it's yours. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. They finally, the children of Israel, 70 of them went down into Egypt to get saved from a famine. The, the sons of, of Jacob or the sons of Israel went down. There were 70 of them. And they stayed 400 some odd years first part of it, they lived very productive and very blessed and, and they were, lived in peace and harmony with the Egyptians. But the last part of it, they lived as slaves, beat down, oppressed. And finally, the Lord came through for them with a miracle in one night. Not only did they get to leave, but Egypt paid them to leave, right? Two years after leaving the, Egypt, they arrived at the promised land. Two years, they stood at Kadesh. There were 40 spies, Numbers chapter 13, that were sent out by Moses to check out the land. And when they came back, the first thing they said was, it's exactly like he told us it would be. The promised land is just like God promised. Flows with milk and honey. It's got grapes. It's got pomegranates. It's got figs. It's got everything, vineyards, Forest, it's got everything we need. But faith in God was overwhelmed at the sight of the enemy. They said, but there's strong people there. There's giants there. And they all live in great big walled cities. We can't do it. Their refusal to go into the promised land their refusal to believe God and go into the promised land was met with 40 years of judgment in the wilderness. But the blessings and tests of the wilderness were given to them to build faith. That's what we've called formation. 
And finally, they came back to the promised land. And guess what? It was the same as it was the first time they went. The same promises and the same obstacles. Everybody say same promises. Same, promises. same obstacles. How many of y'all besides me and, and a few other people I've talked about feel like since we've been going through this series, your frustration level is just rising? People make you mad. Stuff gets on your nerves. You feel like you're on an edge. So let's talk about invading the land. A casting out of the enemy. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 6 says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whether thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven different groups of people, seven greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them. Everybody say smite them. And utterly, and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Come on, somebody. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. But here's how I want you to deal with them. I want you to destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So what's, what's the deal with destroying all of this? Anybody feeling it? What's the deal with destroying these people, their manner of worship, their manner of life, get rid of them completely? Why? Because they're going to drag you down. They're going to slow you down. They're going to mess you up. And they're going to ultimately lead you away from God. But if you don't go to the wilderness and you don't learn the things we've been teaching, and this is where my pastoring and my preaching and my teaching and my real life is going to have to learn to separate. Because once I have delivered the word to you, it is your responsibility to receive the word. It is, I am not in responsible for the results. But you wonder why things ain't working out right. And you wonder why you're not getting answers to the questions that you need. And you wonder why you're continuing to have to struggle. It is because we think we can do this our way. But you're not, he said, Seven nations greater and mightier than you. So when you do this your way, you do this without the Lord. And you can't win without him. You're a holy people. A chosen people. A set aside people. A special people above all people that are upon the face of the earth. These seven nations for us represent seven spiritual strongholds that have to be torn down in the promised land. I have to confess to you, I've always kind of had this idea, Brother Chris, in my mind that when I went across Jordan, it's going to be smooth sailing. Not so. Matter of fact, 
the lessons I learned in the wilderness are for what I'm about to go through right now. Because the enemy don't want to leave. Why don't the enemy want to leave? Because it's a good land. It's a blessed place. It's a fruitful place. Look here. This is what the wilderness prepared us for. Several years ago, I think about 2016 or, or so, Brother Rick Lovell sent me a handout. That's what's on the back page there, covering these seven spirits and how they are revealed in today's church culture. Now, in Exodus chapter 23, verses 28 through 30, do you have that for me? Exodus 23, 28, 29, and 30, and I'm going to summarize it, but it's going to be there. And I will send hornets before thee, which are going to drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. Now, I want you to think, there's three of those nations the Lord is going to drive out. Then there's four that you're going to have to drive out. So there are three spirits, three spiritual strongholds that the Lord is going to get rid of. And then there's going to be four that you have to get rid of. Is that not what we've been learning here for months? It's a collaborative effort between me and God. But somebody told me one time, get the Holy Ghost, it'll fix everything. Right? Didn't work out like that. Because if that was the case, the Lord would have said, y'all just camp out on top of that hill. I'm going to wipe everybody out for you, and then I'll let you have it. But that would be irresponsible. What's happened in our world with a generation that's had everything give to them? Ain't working out so good for us. So look here. There are three that the Lord's going to drive out. The Hittites, which represent for us the spirit of fear. The Canaanites, which represent for us the spirit of humiliation. And the Hivites, which for us represent the spirit of vanity. But verse number 30 he says, 29, give me 29. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year. Next verse. By little and little will I drive them out from before thee until thou be increased. What do you think that means? Grown enough, strong enough to handle them being gone and inherit the land. He said, I'm not going to do it all at once, but I'm going to do it little by little. Ladies and gentlemen, can I introduce you to another process? As we grow, you mean my growing ain't done in the wilderness? Not by a long shot, baby. You see that? I said, I'm not going to do it all at once, but it's going to be a process. And as you grow, we're going to get rid of fear. Everybody say, I like it. We're going to get rid of the spirit of a bully, humiliation. Say, I like it. And we're going to get rid of the spirit of vanity. Not all of you do. I can tell. So, Let's talk about them. The first one the Lord said he's going to drive out is the Hittites. The Hittites were a violent people who brought terror to Israel. The spirit that the Hittites represent is fear. The picture of the operation of the Hittites is terrorism. How many of you know that acts of terror are not about what the act is. They're about what you feel like after the act is over. The terror. The picture of the operation of the Hittites is terrorism, which we see, we are meant to understand that they are spiritual wolves. The application of this spirit's influence is fear and intimidation and the way to destroy this spirit is to reveal it by shining the light of truth on it. 
these who will blatantly try to destroy us. And Jesus warned us of these. Do you not believe this morning? Man, this morning I was here at the church. I'm just going to take a little sidetrack and then I'm going to get back on course. I was here at the church and I was just talking to the Lord a little bit, just not officially praying, but praying. And I started praying for those who've got a purpose in the kingdom of God. The wheat and the tares. Because the tares got a purpose too. And I, I'm going to be quite honest with you. Let me tell you what my biggest prayer about that is. Anybody have an idea? That I'm not one. Lord, I don't want to be a tear. I don't be, mm, come on, Holy Ghost, help me right now. I don't want to be one that just stays around to cause trouble. You know where the tares are planted? Same field as the wheat. Woo. I think it got a little rich in here right then. <coughs> Jesus warned of these types in Matthew 7 and 15 when he said, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. I looked up that word ravening. Several different definitions, but here's the, the, the one that stuck out to me. Opportunistically devious, quickly stealing that which is vulnerable, ravening, snatching. You look it up, it's to reach in and snatch out the weak and snatch out the wounded. And Jesus said, beware, because when they come to you in sheep's clothing, what does that mean? They look like a sheep. But inside, they're trying to destroy you. Ladies and gentlemen, please forgive me for being just plain, but I, I felt something in the prayer room tonight, and I felt it during worship tonight, and the Lord is ready for us to go to another level. And we have to first do it in our minds. You better wake up and realize who is in your life that's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Brother Shannon, the Lord wouldn't have said beware of them if they weren't going to be there. And they were in the promised land. And the Lord said, I'm going to have to get rid of them. But this is one of them. He said, I'm going to get rid of little by little. We would like for the Lord, Sister Leanne, to shazam them out of our life. But you know why he keeps them there? Are y'all ready? Can, can anybody tell me why he keeps them there? Who else is going to nail you to that cross you've been carrying around every day? Huh? Who else is going to hammer them nails in your cross every day? God put people in your life for you to recognize what's wrong and what needs to be killed in you. Come on now, you know good and well. Somebody starts busting a move with some juicy, great, glorious gossip. Your first thought is not. Don't say that around me. But even when you're trying to grow, you're going to get just about halfway away. And I tried to get away, but they just talk too loud. Y'all know I'm telling you the truth. It's just little things like that. But what we have to do is we have to realize I don't want to like that stuff. So I got to go get in the corner somewhere and I got to pray because the fact that I like it is a siren going off in my mind and my life from heaven that says you're in danger, boy. Everybody understand the Hittites, they were violent, they terrorized. And it's the spirit of fear. But you're going to have to face your fears. 
the Lord's going to drive them out. But you're going to have to learn to resist them. The second one, the Canaanites. And this, this, is, this is some rich stuff. These people, the Canaanites, they didn't just want to beat you in battle. They wanted to humiliate you in battle. They lived to embarrass others through shame and abuse. In essence, the Canaanites were a bunch of bullies. The spirit that they represent among us is defeatism or resignation that there's no hope. The application of the influence of this spirit is the act of bringing others down. And I, I, I'm kind of scared to teach this. I am kind of scared to teach this. Because I tell you what, it's going to have to happen. We're down where the rubber meets the road. And some of these sheep in wolves' clothing, or these wolves in sheep's clothing, and some of these bullies that tear us down are going to be people that you're not willing to get out of your life. I felt it heavy today. The reason is, I see it happening. The way we destroy this spirit is to refuse to listen to its voice. And how do I refuse to listen to its voice? By recognizing that it violates the word of God. So I refuse to listen to its voice and we teach both personal or individual and corporate building up or edification. That we're here to build one another up, that we're here to edify one another and learn how to edify yourself. That worked out pretty good for David. Huh? The book said he encouraged himself in the Lord. Why can't you encourage yourself? You can talk yourself into being depressed. Okay. Matthew 5, 43, 44, and 45. You have heard that it hath been said, that's this is the law. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That was that eye for an eye stuff in the law. Jesus don't roll like that. But I say unto you, I'm trying to hurry. I know it's late. I know it's late. I know what time the news comes on. But I say unto you, love your enemies. We're in the promised land, folks. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you. Anybody got any idea what that despitefully use you is talking about? The Canaanite spirit. The bully spirit. I looked it up. That word despitefully, the word that we, a bigger word that's more modern would be insolent. I-N-S-O-L-E-N-T. And it means to be boldly rude or disrespectful or insulting. You're supposed to pray for the Canaanites. Say, what, I'm supposed to get rid of them. You ain't supposed to get rid of the Canaanites. The Lord's going to get rid of the Canaanites. But he left the Canaanites in your life to see if you'll submit to him. Huh? He left them there to see if you'll submit to him. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. These identify you as a child of God. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Which means being good or being bad doesn't have anything to do with the things life deals you. It's going to come to good people and it's going to come to bad people. But we control how we behave to the ones who we consider bad. The Hivites. This is the third, oh Lord, I really, I want to be so clear right now. I don't want to be careful, but I want to be really clear. The 
because many of us, we're not sure if we want to be like Jesus or we want to be like Taylor Swift. That's what this spirit is. We're not sure if we want to be like Jesus or we want to be like, I can't, I'm scared to say some of them names because they might stand for something bad. <laughs> And I'm too dumb to know. But there's so many influencers in our world. Even church people are influenced by them. That's the spirit of the Hivites. Here, look here. Look here. The Hivites. These are village dwellers who want the best of both worlds. The spirit they represent is vanity. Vanity. You know what vanity is? Nothing. But you know how much money, time, effort, and energy we spend on vanity? Most of it. I'm going to preach about it real soon. Get ready. The Lord spoke to me about it. There's freedom in recognizing what's vanity. Vanity. Look what, this, look what the application of this spirit is. A personal justification of a lifestyle that is contrary to the word of God. Because it's cool, it's okay for me. It, this is what the spirit of the Hivites is. Listen to what he said. Their, notor, their notoriety was found in the social realms. The social realms. What's the social realms? Anybody have any idea? Yeah, it's the world. Look here. In the social realms is where the ideal of living according to a worldly standard is encouraged and nurtured. Living in the social realms. That means you live your life according to what those around you do. What's considered cool and what's considered in. And that ain't never changed. The picture of this, this spirit in operation is being lukewarm spiritually. Does anybody know what the characteristic is of a lukewarm person that spiritually lukewarm? You're oblivious. You don't know if you're burning up hot for the Lord. You don't know if you're freezing cold for the Lord. You're just oblivious. Yes. Yep. That's the scripture we're fixing to go to. Yep. But that you're exactly right. And, and most theologians agree that's the, the, the spiritual dispensation that we're living in now. The church age. Okay. I feel like, I feel like I'm not connected good tonight. Man, the picture of the spirit of the Hivites, can you turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about in the promised land. <laughs> Lukewarm spiritually, which is not knowing exactly where you stand. And the way to destroy this spirit is to remove carnality and teach healthy doctrine which healthy doctrine is God sets the standards for how I live my life, not the world. Because Brother David mentioned it already, Revelation 3, 15, 16, and 17. He said, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, increase with goods, have need of nothing. And I feel such a heavy burden coming on me right now. Such a heavy burden. Because you laugh and you giggle. You do your own thing. You go your own way. You 
convinced yourself you're okay. And you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Stay with me just a minute. I'm about to, un I'm, I'm, I'm going to reveal some things. You cannot be in love with the world and be healthy with God. You can't do it. The Amorites, that's the fourth one. I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming to it. Listen to this. It just goes hand in glove, Brother David, with what you said about oblivious. Look what the characteristics of the Amorites are. These people were worshipers of a God that was just like the true God in what they preached about. But he offered nothing in the way of power. So it was a religion that didn't change anything, that didn't affect anything. You can go to church, you can give, you can clap, you can worship, you can go through the motions, but nothing ever happens because God is not involved. There is no evidence of his existence beyond what is said about him. And the spirit that the Amorites represent is idolatry, which is, if you've heard me teach before, the Bible says stubbornness is as idolatry and stubbornness is self-worship. And the picture of the, their operation is powerlessness and sensationalism, which means they know how to go through the motions just like the true worshipers. But nothing ever happens. There is no evidence of the power of the Holy Ghost. The application of this spirit's influence is in false doctrine. And the way we destroy this spirit is to teach the authority of God. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This know also that in the last days, everybody say we're there. In the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. We're there. It's a sign of the end time. It ain't going away. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, which is liars, incontinent, which means no self-control, fierce, which means angry and, and brutal, despisers of those that are good, it means jealous and envious and full of strife, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Look at verse 5, having a form of godliness, which means what? What does that mean, having a form of godliness? What's that, Brother Shannon? Look the part. What'd you say, Shelly? <coughs> Going through the motions. Going through the motions. Same thing. We know how to be religious. But denying the power thereof. And the last part says, the parasites. Number five, here we go, I'm going to mess with you because we got parasites in our church. Loners who do not like walls and live without unity. The spirit they represent is disunity and the application of this spirit is a lack of submission and the picture of this spirit in operation is loners who pastor themselves. Which means they like the preacher, but they don't like the pastor. The way to destroy this spirit is to establish boundaries 
both personal and corporate boundaries because there's going to be things the Holy Ghost is going to say no to you about that pastor don't preach about. You better listen. And unity. Establish unity. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 15. Listen to what the Bible says. We're talking about loners who don't want to be around nobody, who do their own thing, who stay away from everybody and everything. That's got to go in the promised land. And Brother Christian, we're now into the area we've got to fix it. Okay. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord. So now you have peers, co-workers, soldiers in the same army, and what else do you have? A leader, authority. Know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord. How do you do that living on your island? You can't. And admonish you and to esteem them very highly for their work's sake, highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Does anybody see the isolation in that passage? You can't do it. A picture of a healthy community, be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, Comfort the feeble-minded. Support the weak. Be patient toward all men. You can't do that. Hiding out in a corner somewhere. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves, both among yourselves, both among yourselves. How do you do it among yourselves and the strangers except you're part of the community? Can't be by yourself. N number six. Jebusites. I'm going to bring it home, y'all. <clears throat> Real quickly, about to lose my voice. <clears throat> Here's what Jebusites were. Now, you've got the option to say he's a stick in the mud. He's out of touch. He just looked for something to fill up a Wednesday night, which if you think that, you're about three-quarter crazy. And one quarter right. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Jebusites, they were the ones who inhabited Jerusalem before the Jews got there. They were polluters who lived in filth. And the spirit they represent is pollution. The application of this spirit is one that becomes accommodating of sin. You make allowances for sin. You justify sin. The picture of this spirit in operation is that impurity abounds more and more. And the way to destroy it is to teach and to submit to practical, biblical holiness. One bad apple will ruin the whole bunch. But I'm going to give you a revelation right now from the book of Revelation. And I'm going to let you know where I stand. Because I told y'all one time, I ain't blind. I ain't stupid. But I'm trying to help people make it to heaven. And I am not in the business of destroying people. Because the Lord didn't destroy me when I was a fool. Let me say this better. He doesn't destroy me when I am a fool. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira, write these things, saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. He said, I want you to know that I know your works and I know your charity and I know your service and I know your faith and I know your patience and your works and the last to be more than the first. The things you're going to do are greater than the things you've done. But we got a problem. Next verse. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Y'all know what that word sufferest means right there? 
allow her. It means you, you allow it. You tolerate her. To teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, which means you are a pretty good group of people, but you've allowed Jezebel to retain her influence and to preach her message and to harm your people. But look at verse 21. This is so powerful. It happened to me this past couple of weeks. And I gave her space to repent. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. Holy Ghost spoke to me so powerfully through this scripture today. Because before he goes to damning and condemning, he gave her space to repent, Brother David. That scares me. I don't like that part, Brother Shannon. I don't like that part. Not, not because I worry about her, but I worry about what everybody thinks. But Brother Terrence, the scripture said he gave Jezebel space to repent of her fornication, but she wouldn't. She repented not. So look what he says. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. That means there's some things you're doing you shouldn't be doing. You know you shouldn't be doing them. And if you don't make some changes, the Lord is going to step in and do what you wouldn't do. Y'all hear the man of God right now? Y'all know we've had people quit coming on Wednesday nights? So they don't have to if you don't hear the teaching, you don't have to obey the teaching. Next week's going to be good, Brother Shannon. We're going to start teaching about the purity of the doctrine, the plan of salvation. But tonight, we have got to get the influences of the enemy that we let to stay you feel conviction right now. But then when you go back and go to bed with Jezebel, you understand that's not talking about literal fornication. That's talking about spiritual things. All right? He said, I gave her space to repent. What they're doing as influenced by this spirit, they must repent of. Seven, the Gergeshites. This will be it. The Gergeshites were cave dwellers. In the Hebrew, their name means to drag away, and the spirit they represent is temptation. Because the Bible says every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The picture of operation is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And the application of the Spirit's influence is to be carnally or earthly minded. And the way we destroy this is to teach and practice being spiritually minded and to know and apply the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16 says, But as it is written, eyes not seen, nor ear heard, nor neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. What does that tell you? He wants us to know what he has prepared for us. 
We like to preach eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for them. But the next verse says, but he's revealed them to us by his spirit. You understand this has a connection to last Sunday's message because, Brother David, he is revealing things to us that the distraction is stopping us from getting. Look here. The Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? So we're dealing now with who you really are, not who you want people to think you are. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. You will not be able to figure God out with your carnal mind. But we keep trying. Look verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. I had on my mind tonight, I'm, I'm about to close, I'm about to close. I had on my mind tonight that I needed to use this lesson to put some shotgun shells in my spiritual preaching gun and kabloom it. And the Spirit said, you teach the Word and it'll be enough. Because look here. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. That we, He wants us to know what He has for us. Which things... Also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. So there's a different life that man's wisdom will teach me than what the Holy Ghost will teach me. Right? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Listen, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. You know, Brother David, even right now, that through this teaching, I know there are people thinking of ways that this ain't right. But the problem is, is you're trying to fight a spiritual battle with your carnal want-tos. And the Bible says, Brother David, that the carnal mind is enmity against God because it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that's why before you try to come to me, won't you do some fasting and praying? Because the ones that get their toes hit by this, the ones that feeling strongly convicted by this, the ones that cause me to grieve all night long, Because yesterday, Brother Derek, you got me on the early morning hours. Today, 2.45 this morning, that's when I was up. If you cause me to grieve and you grieve the Holy Ghost, it's because you're not praying and you're not fasting and you're not reading your Bible and you are not working the Word on your own time. And it shows up. Holiness starts slipping. A giving starts slipping. Your worship starts slipping. Because, Brother David, you wandered over into a lukewarm place. You know the danger about being in a lukewarm place? You know nothing, but it feels good. Look here. 
The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But, look here. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Now, this, this didn't make no sense to me when I first read it. That word judgeth means make decisions about or evaluate. So we're making decisions being spiritual that we are not subject to. Here's what's got to happen is we have got to stop. Here we go, Brother Shannon. We have got to stop trying to defend what God's doing to carnal people because they ain't going to get it. That's what that scripture's saying. He that is spiritual can evaluate everything that's going on. Because if you're spiritual, you're locked into what God's doing. But he that's not spiritual hadn't got a clue in the world what's going on. Why waste your time trying to convince a carnal mind of spiritual things? Next verse. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Who determines what the Lord is doing or what the Lord is going to do? He does. But I'm going to bring back an old Bible study from, oh, like three weeks ago. <laughs> but what are we supposed to be doing with what the Lord's doing? That's when we, Brother Ronnie, you ain't got what I'm saying right now. And you put it on Facebook post and you talked about it in men's meeting. He knows what he's doing. And he shares it with us in them strategy sessions of heaven, the plans. But we can't do that until we start getting the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites and the Hittites and the Hivites out of the promised land. But when you let them stay, what happens? They lead you astray. They destroy your children. Stand with us. I covered way, way too much stuff in one time tonight, and I apologize for that. But I hope the goodness, I know, I know it was muddy. I know it was, and I apologize for it. But I am telling you, the Holy Ghost is getting ready. Let me tell you something. He ain't coming back on April 8th. Brother David, I read where he said, if they say he's going to be right there, guess what? Guarantee he ain't. Yeah, he ain't coming on April the 8th. But I am going to tell you something. He may come before April the 8th. The Lord is getting ready to come for his bride. And he is challenging us. He is calling us. Brother Shannon, I'm going to tell you what. I think today is my first day breathing air out of the birth canal. I have felt something in the Holy Ghost today that I didn't feel yesterday. I have felt the power. Let me tell you what I feel very strongly. The, the only thing struggling tonight is my flesh. But I came into this Bible study as confident as I've been in the Bible study in a long time because I've been coming in here scared because I've been coming in here unsure of myself because I don't know whether I'm coming or going. But the Holy Ghost came I said, well, I don't really understand that. That's why I gave you that handout. You go home and you pray over it. But I'm telling you right now, you're going to have to stop playing games with the Lord. You're going to have, going to, have to quit trying to date the devil throughout the week and hang out with the Lord on Sunday. Now, I want you to hear me right now. It ain't funny. It ain't cute. It's not innocent. You are playing spiritual roulette with your soul. Sure. Yeah, 
or, or Well, the thing is, he can come for us at any time. And, and this is, I, I, I'm not big on manipulating people and trying to get all ooh and, and scaring people where they say, I got to get out of here. I'm scared to death. The Lord's about to come right now. I'm not into that. But I am telling you that we better get off of Facebook and we better get off of TikTok and we better get off of Twitter, and we better get out of the real housewives, and we better get out of the days of our lives and get our nose in the word of God and get on our face before God and start driving the things out of the promised land that he called us to drive out and let him drive out the ones that he said he would drive out. Lord, I love you tonight. I love you tonight, and I feel that... that uh, Lord Jesus, I feel it. The prophet Joel said of it, and it's in the room right now. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. It's heavy in this room tonight, Lord. There are those that they want to look like the world, act like the world, be like the world, feel like the world, and somehow hold on to some semblance of Christianity or some semblance of a relationship with God, and it's deception. It is deception. It is perilous deception. And we are ready to go to the promised land. We're ready to go to new levels. We're ready to go and be used and to fulfill our purpose. And, and we're ready to start seeing victory just like they sang about. But, Lord, we're going to have to submit ourselves to you. We're going to have to surrender our lives to you. And we're going to have to let the authority of the Lord flow down just like it's supposed to. And we're going to have to become who we're supposed to be in you. I pray, God, that you will indeed grant us repentance unto life, just like it happened in Cornelius' house. I praise you, Lord, for your word. In Jesus' name. I need to meet with everybody that cooks for recovery for about five minutes after this. And don't forget to rally Friday night. That's for our church, too. All right? Starts at 724 with prayer. Please don't play hooky. God bless you. You're dismissed. Oh, hi, Lacey. My grandson, my grandmother just passed away today. Yep. And we're doing stuff at Gmail Church Ministries. They just need to pray for the family and for their loved ones. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to do right now. Yeah. We're going to help them. Caitlin's married to my cousin. That's my grandson. Yeah. Caitlin's your daughter? Yeah. Well, Amanda's my first cousin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Amanda's mama is my daddy's sister. Yeah, they called me this morning. We're going to help them. We should.